everyone to put your phones on silent mode and keep your volume and discussion to a minimal level. Um, please leave only in between speeches. Um, now, on the motion that this house would give cities full authority to accept or reject internal migrants, um, I invite the Prime Minister to finish, to start off this debate. <laughs>
For a poor person in India, Mumbai is perceived as a city where the opportunities are endless and limitless. Then again, a year later, that same poor person is living in a slum and struggling to pay back all of these opportunities, pay back the debt and to find a job and to struggle to find end ends meet for his family. So we think that that is the problem in today's debate. The problem is underdevelopment. The problem is influx in these major cities where the job opportunities are always endless. But the problem is also about this the safety and the what's best for these internal migrants as a whole. So the problem right now is what we want to meet ticket right what happens is that there is one central city where the place is very developed and there are a lot of job opportunities and then there is for example city b which is underdeveloped and all of these internal migrants want to move into city a where it's developed and what happens is that there's influx of people in city a there's too many people to cater to that so-called job market that is so-called endless right and those are the problems that we want to mitigate and then city b is left underdeveloped where they have brain drain where there's no one to cater to these people who is living in that city that is the problem in today's debate that side government wants to propagate to you so this debate is generally what we want to what why is the responsibility to for these cities to say where should these internal migrants go and why can't the internal migrants go wherever they want to go in the first place so because of that we think that it's legitimate our policy is our, our policy is simple. What we think what happens is that cities are the ones to regulate all of these people who are coming in and coming out of uh, um, of these cities as a whole. But on what basis do they do they do this? Simply on influx, on how many people are in that city as a whole. It's not catered to how many jobs or how many doctors are there. It's just catered to how many people are in that city per se. So our end goal is to basically just have an equal amount of development for all these countries so that the country can then prosper better when all of this development is scattered through about and not just centralized in one capital city. So then goes into the first argument, right? Why is under development and what is going to happen when we do have these regulations? We have city A, which is underdeveloped and there's brain drain and there's no many people that are specialized in it. And we have city B that is developed. What happens when you have city b right they are it's harmful for these internal migrants when they go there and they think that there is a job market there and when they find that there isn't any job market there because of the high competition when you have people from city uh who, that is under underdeveloped necessarily they're always unskilled because of these circumstances they go to city uh, a which is developed what happens is that they usually have to go for hard labor which necessarily does not mean a higher standard of living for them so we think that because of that it's actually better for them to stay in where they are uh, for better for their families as a whole rather than going to a place where it has higher competition which is harder for them to go about their daily life so what happens is that we don't we think that in in country in country where there is in cities where there is developed what happens is that right now because of the increase of a competition and what happens is that there, there is less people to hire as a whole because all of these jobs are being filled up and when you have people who are necessarily unskilled are who are left out in a uh, left out they have to cater and have to stay there because they don't have money to go back to where to, to a place where they where they can't even have a job right so what happens is that they have to live here and they are unskilled and you are they have they are then in turn jobless so at the end of the day their so-called conclusion of going to the city which is developed to find a job is never met in the first place so we want to cater to that. We want to help these people as a whole. But before that, show up your eye. Amen. Uh, could you clarify on how you think we should deny the right of a person who thinks he will get better opportunities, if not the best, in a capital than in his own underdeveloped rural area? My whole explanation of how these people always have that per perception that if going to this developed city actually brings them opportunity, opportunity and more often than not do not have a job at the end of the day shows that the, the the irrationality of an internal migrant thinking that yes i will get a job at the end of the day shows that th this conclusion is more often than not not met in at the end so we think that because of that these cities can cater that these cities know what's best for these internal migrants because they are the ones who are in who are regulating and understand the statistics of how the job market is working in the first place so goes into our talking about how what happens in city b and city a right and what's best for the developed cities so what happens in developed cities when you have a lot of poor people who don't have jobs who are staying there and don't have enough money to go back to where they are what happens is that 
you have a development of slums, a development of a lot of poor people. When you have a lot of poor people, you have people getting desperate. You have people who go to whatever jobs they want to do because they need to find money for their families. And that is harmful for these internal migrants. That's why we think that it's okay for the cities to do so because we know what's best and we understand that how the job market works in these developed cities at most times. When you have these people who are going to do whatever it, at, at, at whatever cost to do, what happens is that there's, there is an influx and there's increasement of crime rates in a bigger city. When you have crime rates, what happens is that the standards of living in that country is already harmful. We have the living standards in that city going low and we have people who are unemployed and you have the job markets having a higher competition and therefore there's a lot of skillful people and people who are unskilled don't have a job. And therefore, because of that, we think that crime rates can lead up to that. And therefore, that's, that reputation of that social so called developed city will go down and and and, and it's worse for that standard of, for that for people living in that city right and then goes into what happens to then then city that is left underdeveloped and we want to cater to that right because everybody's moving out from that country what happens to that city right now is that there's no one there but what we think is when we have that regulation of pushing people into underdeveloped countries uh, cities what happens is that that we are forcing these people to have a job market we're forcing them to this city to cater to this under uh, internal migrants so what happens is for example Example, there's an influx of people in an underdeveloped city, right? For example, they usually had two schools, but now because there's too many, there's a lot of regulation and they have um, about equal amounts of people. Now we have increasement of schools, which means there's increasement of jobs for that for that city. So because of that, we think that it's better for this underdeveloped country because we push people to scatter uh, for equally to scatter people about so that we develop these underdeveloped places. Because the only problem that these places these places are underdeveloped in the first place is because of um, decrease of people living there in the, um, at, at, from the get-go. So we think that we need to regulate how many people are in all of these cities to cater to these internal migrants. We think that as a whole, we don't think internal migrants can choose wherever they want to go because of our uh, because of that perception that at the end of the day, more often than not, these people don't get what they want at the end, um, what they want when they go to a developed city. So our end goal is simple, and we think that we cater to that. We cater to these people who want to have a job at the end of the day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I come from Bangladesh. My parents grew up in Kumilla, a very rural area isolated from the capital city, Dhaka, where there were no opportunities at all. Now, admitting the fact that Dhaka is a very overpopulated city, if the government imposed this decision on my parents that they could not come to Dhaka, if they took that hope away, ladies and gentlemen, I would not be standing here today, ladies and gentlemen. I would not be here defending my cause, ladies and gentlemen. We believe that no government no city, despite any reason, has the power to overstep their authority and tell the people, guess what? Because of our failure, because of our failure that we cannot maintain the population here, because of our failure that we do not build factories, give good job opportunities in rural area, you cannot come up here. We believe that this is morally, principally wrong and has detrimental effects, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, and we believe that is exactly where their whole policy fails, ladies and gentlemen. But before that, let's move on to some refutals. See, ladies and gentlemen, they have come up and talked about how apparently these people from rural areas, who where there is no opportunities at all, somehow go to these capital cities, these urban areas, and then they live a worse condition of life. Understand the general as a. Uh, assumption in this they would like to assume that the conditions the job opportunities in urban cities in capitals for example are far worse than rural cities where in reality there are hardly any job opportunities in rural cities at all understand this ladies and gentlemen if i being in a village such as kumilla ladies and gentlemen believe that by going to dhaka i can at least have a marginal benefit or improvement in my life i may not become a ceo of a major company but even if i do get a job at mcdonald's or kfc ladies and gentlemen and if i believe that it is an improvement for me 
me, ladies and gentlemen. I have every right to do so, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this. I have every right to pursue what I believe is right, what I believe is beneficial for me, and the government can never stop me from doing so, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this. They say the city knows what is best for that pe for their people. That is absolutely unfair and absurd, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this, that under their model, if I were to be born in Dhaka and a person who deserves same equal rights as me were to be born in Kumilla, I would have the right, I would have the capability to live in Dhaka, to go to fancy restaurants, to get good jobs, to get all the benefits. Whereas that person with my same talents, which who deserves equal rights at me, does not have the right to come in Dhaka simply because he was born there, ladies and gentlemen. I ask you this, what gives the government the right to, make, to actually force them? What gives the government, the city, the full authority to stop them from coming to Dhaka, ladies and and gentlemen understand this ladies and gentlemen we are not talking about international migration here ladies and gentlemen we are talking about internal migration in my passport in my national id card ladies and gentlemen it reads bangladeshi i'm a part of sovereign bangladesh ladies and gentlemen i have full authority to go wherever i want to in bangladesh ladies and gentlemen no government no dictator no city council can stop me from doing that ladies and gentlemen understand this if i wish to move from chittagong to dhaka or maybe being a citizen of malaysia if you ladies and gentlemen want to move from Kuala Lumpur to Penang to wherever you want, you have every right to do so, ladies and gentlemen, because you are a citizen of that country. But before that, yes, ma'am. Aren't you denying the rights for citizens of underdeveloped cities to further develop? Ladies and gentlemen, understand the major false assumptions in their case. They assume that if we push, like, for example, 100,000 people in a village, somehow, magically, without government support, without government infrastructure, it's going to be a brand new capital city. It's going to be developed. Understand this. Why are capital cities much better off than other cities? Understand this in terms of geography, ladies and gentlemen. See, in capital cities, that is where the main headquarters are, headquarters of organizations, industries, institutions. That is where the main government offices are. Understand this, that most of the government's expenditure is put into capital capital cities, not into rural areas, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this, that simply by taking people to rural areas, we do not magically make rural areas a better place with more rural job opportunities. Just having workers it is not enough. You need land and capital. That, that is basic economics, ladies and gentlemen. So we believe if they truly want to achieve what they are trying to do here, we believe they the government has the responsibility, not the people. The government has the burden to actually spend on these rural areas, make infrastructure there, right? Maybe build factories or give job opportunities there. We, you do not simply push away the people from the capital, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen. It is the government's burden to bear, not the people. See, ladies and gentlemen, as I've told you, that government expenditure, expenditure is not equal. They, it is spent more on capital cities. But unfortunately, the people of Chittagong, in, in my case, and the people of Dhaka have to pay the same amount of tax, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this, the people of Dhaka and the people of Chittagong, assuming they have same incomes, have to pay the similar amount of tax. But that tax which, which the government takes, majority of it, more, more of it is spent on Dhaka than in Chittagong, ladies and gentlemen. So we believe that those people of Chittagong have every right to go to Dhaka because they paid that tax, they deserve that right, ladies and gentlemen. We believe it is unfair when you say, in spite of the fact that we have paid similar taxes, you cannot come into Dhaka simply because you were born in Chiragong. Shit, bad luck. We believe that is wrong, ladies and gentlemen, because they deserve the equal right of movement from one place to another in their own country. That is a fundamental human right, like right to food, right to education, right to clothes, ladies and gentlemen. Right, moreover, ladies and gentlemen, let us now move on to my case about how there is lack of diversity when this happen and my second speaker will talk about talk here about the necessity of multicultural 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 right now ladies and gentlemen understand this if their policy was put forward the people of boston could not go to people the people of new york which is a uh, could not go to new york and interact with the people of new york which is a densely populated area understand this that people from one society which has a racial or religious dominance could not go to another society. Understand this. This would mean that there is no inter interaction there. This would increase, the, uh, this would decrease diversity, increase division, decrease unity, which we believe is fundamentally wrong and harms the country, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this. If the people of Kuala Lumpur were not allowed to interact with the people of other parts of Malaysia, ladies and gentlemen, there would be no interaction, ladies and gentlemen. People could not maybe share ideas, work together. You would actually create Divisions within the country that you so want to be united, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this. Now, within a country of Bangladesh, 
a part of Bangladesh would be Kumilla, a part would be Chiragong, a part would be Dhaka. You are literally dividing the people, ladies and gentlemen. And we, and we believe this in no way actually helps in progress of that country, ladies and gentlemen. So what have we shown to you today, ladies and gentlemen? We have shown to you, no matter what the what the premise, ladies and gentlemen, no government deserves the, deserves the right, reserves the right to challenge me to not to come to one place. No government can have the full authority and impose this on me, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm a part of that country. We have shown to you how simply pushing to people to rural areas don't make that areas better. We need government expenditure there, government spending there, and then maybe people will be willing to stay there, ladies and gentlemen, which is a better alternative. So this is exactly why we take this debate home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elo. Uh, now we invite the Deputy Prime Minister as well in case he signs up. It's funny how they wanted to talk about how this was the state's failure in trying to provide infrastructure to the people in the underdeveloped cities. But when we are providing a policy that allows the state to correct its failures, we think that it's perfectly fine for you to want to do this policy. In the long run, when the state has the right and has to have the incentive to want to create further development, further infrastructure in these underdeveloped cities, we think that the only way to provide the incentive to the state is to allow to, to, is to actually regulate the people from these developed cities and and, pro and actually funnel these people into the underdeveloped cities. We think that this is an incentive for the state to create further infrastructure in the underdeveloped cities, therefore provide more job opportunities, which is what Jasmine has told you and they failed to recognize at the, from the very first, right? First of all, they want to talk about how the state has failed. But when we talk to you on the characteristics of the state, how the state has a therefore has a direct incentive to want to invest in these underdeveloped cities because of the fact that there is a there are regulate there are regulatory mechanisms of people flowing into the underdeveloped cities because you are now disallowing these people to always go to the developed cities in the first place so when the now when now the government has the incentive to develop these underdeveloped cities we think that the state failure can then be corrected you under your side are not providing the opportunity for that state failure to be corrected you can't continuously blame the state if you are not providing them an opportunity to develop sit down secondly they want to talk about how there's no job opportunities in under in underdeveloped cities we think that no this can be catered to by the amount of people going into the underdeveloped cities now you have to open more more houses so more houses means you have to have more people building these houses these are the kind of opportunities that can arise when more people go into these underdeveloped uh, underdeveloped cities in the first place secondly is on the quality of the jobs that you can get in underdeveloped cities compared to in developed cities in developed cities if you are a person of not uh, of skills that aren't that great as, to, as compared to people who are in the developed cities your quality of job is probably just working in kfc is what he said if your quality of job is just working in kfc as compared to an underdeveloped city where you might get a job as a teacher because of the lack of lack of people actually doing this job we think that this is a better quality and we are and we are willing to absorb that. Thirdly, he wanted to talk about the rights of individuals to move from cities to city. But the thing is that the rights of these individuals aren't absolute because it comes as a third party harm. What is the third party harm in this scenario? The third party harm is when other citizens, citizens who do have a right to that country in itself, are denied the opportunity to develop because these people are continuously going to the developed cities in the first place. That is the right that they are denying and that is also the right that they wanted to protect in the first place. We think that we allow these people, we think that rights are absolute in any scenario and therefore we cater to this. And their characterization is that cities only funnel money into, into city capitals and things like this. Exactly the point. City, the government will only funnel money into cities that have an opportunity and have a, a potential of developing. When you provide Provide that potential to this underdeveloped city, we think the government will be more likely to fund the money into that city at the end of the day. Fifth, you want to talk about the lack of diversity and how there will be no interaction at all. M Mr. Speaker, this is actually a very extreme characterization. There is no probability there will be no interaction at all. We aren't just rejecting these people. We are accepting and rejecting based on the proportionality of what the state decides. We think that this is why there will still be interaction within communities and we think that that harm is non-existent under their side. 
So let's look at a few arguments that we have. We have to look at the long term and the bigger picture of this scale. So when a city is able to regulate the amount of internal migrants coming in and out, we know that most, most of the people in status quo are going out to develop cities in the first place. If they leave the home city as underdeveloped and left to be underdeveloped because all the smart minds, all the people with good skills think that they can have better opportunities in the developed city. We think that this is a mindset that is very hard to change. And we need to, uh, because of the time sensitivity and how we want the underdeveloped city to develop further and to develop faster to help the people in, in the underdeveloped city, this is why we need to put this policy in place right now. We think that brain drain is a very real thing. It happens on a big scale. And this is actually a smaller scale of it, which happens internally in the country itself. If you as a government of a country is able to regulate people because of the fact that you are scared that your, your resources, your skill sets will then go out of your country, we think that a state should be able to do so as well, because the state is also functioning as a country just on a smaller level. We think that that right is provided to the state at the end of the day. So what happens when we think that people who are good skill sets are actually going out of the underdeveloped city is this. Because we think that the people in developed cities, even though you have good skill sets, your skill sets in a developed city might not be as valuable as, an, as in an underdeveloped city. We think that this is harmful. Why? Because it's harder for you to start off in, an, in a developed city where everyone, almost everyone, has your skill sets. In an underdeveloped city, not everyone has your skill sets, and that's where they need it the most. That is shameful, and that is the harm that we want to, that is the harm that we want to prevent at the end of the day. The harm to these people, uh, uh, the harm to this developed city at the end, at this developing city at, this, as, at the end of the day, is that they lose good skill sets that they need to continuously develop, and the good skill sets that they need to progress further for the citizens in that underdeveloped city in the first place. And it's also harder for them to start off and to actually progress because there's no one in that city that is willing to make that start off position to become a developed city at the end of the day. So what is the harm of this? We think that the living standards of people in the develop in the city would be therefore for lower and we, we don't think it will be actually be able to actualize to its full potential at the end of the day we think it's bad for the country as a whole why because we think that cities develop outwards this is like kl it develop outwards outwards into pataling jaya so if you funnel people into a city like kota baru in Klantan, we think that therefore the city of kota baru when you have more people more job opportunities more money coming in means that that city will develop further into the whole state of Klantan at the end of the day we think that this further develops the whole state and will therefore actually move to develop the whole country in the long run. We think that this is the long term that side, uh, that side opposition actually fails to think about. We are willing to take the short term harm of this internal migrant possibly not getting a job and not getting the opportunity to move to this, um, uh, to this developed city at the expense of possibly the whole country becoming developed at an eco pace and the whole country being able to develop because of the fact that cities develop and they, they, and they spread outwards at the end of the day. We think that this is a very important benefit. Uh, secondly, we have to look at the people because now the people no longer have that the people will still have that illusion that a developed city will always provide them the better opportunities. But now, at least there is some form of regulation to prevent those people from getting their hopes down. That his, his parents from Bangladesh were part of the minority that were able to get a good, stable job in the city of Dhaka. But you have to look at the majority of people who aren't necessarily able to do so. We think that that is a minority case and that is not necessarily happening at the end of the day. We think that also allows more opportunities for an individual to develop in these cities which are underdeveloped because of the fact that these people, their skill sets would be more needed there as compared to in a developed city in itself. It also might be a short term harm, but we are willing to absorb that for the good of the country at the end of the day. We are very proud to propose. Thank you, Vitya. Now we invite Yellow to continue the case for side opposition. Team government's case. They claim that when villagers or rural people 
go to cities, they face worse living standards because of few jobs, right? We tell you that this is not so, because what, what cities are we talking about in this context, right? These are cities which have more uh, availabilities, right? These are cities which have more uh, have more availabilities of uh, schools or healthcare, etc., right? But even in this case, which are the cities where people actually go from or migrate from rural areas to cities, right? These are cities which have at least more job sectors than such rural areas, right? But even if we consider that these cities will not be able to uphold this uh, influx, we tell you that cities at least have more jobs than those areas, rural areas, right? Therefore, these cities cannot dictate that decision over these people who are from coming from rural areas to not go to a place which have at least even slightly more, um, slightly more advantage, slightly more job sectors for those particular people, right? Because understand, even in this context, that uh, maybe from the perspective of people from Chittagong Hill tracks, right? Because in this, in such ge uh, geographical locations, because of the, uh, because of the fact that there are so many hills. The, 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 that's the reason why these people may not have so many job sectors, right? But even in that case, if these people do come to Dhaka, where people have at least slightly more job sectors, we believe that this is some uh, this is a basic fundamental civil right that they should have and something that the cities cannot dictate over them, right? Secondly, they claim that villages villages stay under Delbert, right? We tell you that this is not so because this is something that I'm going to be sh showing you in my case, right? Because villages villages don't stay under Delbert because if people move to the cities, people will have more scope to learn ideas, more scope to learn ide uh, ideologies, knowledge, and certain complex mechanisms that cities run. We believe that this is the lack that villages suffer, suffer from, right? We, we believe that these villages do need such ideas, something that cities do have to give them, right? But even if we consider that villages do stay underdeveloped, we tell you that the people may not feel we tell you that the people may not feel that they have the re huge responsibility to actually develop a, de a develop a village which is cursed by underdevelop right we did under development right we tell you that this village this particular villager may not think that i have the moral responsibility to develop this whole village right maybe he thinks that this is not his his complete burden right and we tell you that the cities cannot dictate over them that guess what you are the one who have to stay back in that village and develop develop your village right we tell sec thirdly they claim the state has no incentive to develop the rural people if the motion is uh, if if people go from villages to uh, villages to urban uh, urban areas and if the motion is passed they will magically have that incentive right we tell you that this is not so because understand this that without multicultural diversity state will not be able to do what they have to do right because city people will never really understand the basic problems the basic necessities that these villages suffer from right the moment in time that these villages move from the rural areas to cities and actually migrate over there we tell you that that's when the interaction will happen that's when the the, the huge gap will be closed there will be that bridge and people will start understanding what sort of problems that villagers suffer from moreover these villagers will actually be able to learn certain complex mechanisms that are needed to develop a uh, develop a society yes please that benefit is only predicated on the fact that that person that moves to a developed city goes back to its village how are your benefits going to be understand this Understand is that up the moment in time that you actually go to a city and work over there, earn some capital, you can always invest that back into the village as well. Even if you do not actually go back to the village. Moreover, we tell you that this happens even in case that you do not move back, right? Something that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be explaining in my in my case, right? Fourth, they claim that cities. Uh, with less people in villages, villagers cannot develop. We tell you that the problem that these villages suffer from is not the lack of workforce, nor the lack of work workers, right? These villages do work. These villages do farm. These villages do whatever they have, they can do, right? But the lack over here, the reason why villages suffer from this underdevelopment is the fact that they do not understand certain ideas, certain, they do not have that knowledge or the knowledge of certain complex mechanisms that are needed to develop a society, right? The moment in time that a villager come to the the villagers come to the cities and actually interact with people so as to understand such complex mechanisms, that's when people actually know that, right? Then they claim that people from rural areas do not have the skill sets to work. Something that I tell you that this is completely false because people who migrate are actually firstly desperate, right? These people are not actually wanting to become a president of the whole nation when they go to a city, right? The, these people are people who are actually maybe wanting to only support their family, maybe because the family is suffering from food, suffering from, uh, suffering from the lack of shelter, Shelter, suffering from the lack of food right and in order to just 
support that family or maybe in order to make sure that he lives on he wants to come back to the come to the city and work right we tell you that in this context the city cannot dictate the decision and tell you that you have to be locked up in your village and you have to die over there no matter what just because i want to see village to develop somewhere somehow magically right so what are we going to bring you today i'm going to be upholding the multicultural diversity's uh, importance right so because understand this that only when a society contains people from different different societies different cultures and different races that's where a society can develop right how is that so because that's when discourse and learning will happen right that's when the everyone learns from each other right we tell you that uh, they, they learn about social development they learn about economic stability they learn about employment right we tell you that that's when people can actually open up certain job sectors even in villages right without that gap without that bridge between these rural areas and within uh, between the cities that can never happen because people from rural areas can actually learn from these people from these people in cities right that's that's when they learn how cities want certain complex mechanisms that are required to develop a society therefore multicultural diversity allows the nation to develop as a whole because that's when it, it because it is only then that these rural people will learn about these mechanisms and therefore they can develop the nation but not only that that's only when the city people can also know about the necessities that these people in villages suffer from that's when the people in villages will uh, the cities will able to know what necessities are these people needing but if this motion is passed what happens is this that there will be no flow of that particular information or ideas not only that each city becomes a each city or village becomes a swarm of people from only one particular race only one particular class or only one particular group of people right because that and that in turn makes make sure that no one would feel the necessity to work for another right the moment in time that the city becomes a place for only higher class of people and the village becomes a place for only uh, low skilled people that's when these people will think that guess what i do not belong to them and therefore i do not need to work for them that's when they feel they feel that they don't have to they don't need to help each other moreover there's a problem with the policy as well right because the moment in time that this motion is passed cities will start accepting or rejecting migrants based on race religion or social prejudices and norms that's when people become become uh, don't feel the necessity or a sense to help each other out and therefore cities or uh, th therefore villages stay underdeveloped as a whole right we are very proud to oppose thank you We want to ensure that people have the best quality. Like we think that's a responsibility of every state to provide the best for its people. That's why we think that the only way for us to ensure that people in the underdeveloped and developed cities have the best quality life that we can provide to you. Right? We have two questions that we need to answer in today's debate. One, do cities have the right to have full autonomy over internal migrants? And secondly, I'll draw a comparison to you between their case and our case. But before that, let's clear up a few characterizations that were misleading in today's debate. Number one, they tried to tell, we already characterized to you about how cities work, about how it, it has a perception that has a lot of endless opportunities. People see advertisements about KL and having it being a majestic city. But at the end of the day, people who do migrate, for example, if someone from Kelantan were to migrate from Kuala Lumpur, they would have a really low income job and not have the best opportunity not have the best quality life that was assured to them via advertisements and what and whatnot and we tell you that cities don't really have the assurance of you getting a really high income job and having and uh, having a really good lifestyle like we tell you the underdeveloped like the characterization of underdeveloped cities was also misplaced right they tried to tell you 
that the benefits that the benefits of underdeveloped can only happen under their side. But we tell you it's not mutually exclusive. It can also happen under our side. We all our side caters to the problem of people leaving the city and not coming back to the city because our side has the regulations that we've already provided to you to begin with. Right? But second characterization, they try to tell you that the exchange of people and the segregation of multi multicultural diversity and what what and whatnot, right? They also try to tell you that it's a harm on the outside because we don't allow people to integrate with each other. But we don't think so, right? Guys, reality chat. Firstly, if you want to put it in context of Malaysia, it's a multiracial country. State lines and city lines are not predicated upon racial diversity. It's predicated upon where the state is, right? That is geographical. You don't you don't bother a state just because it's a fully Malay state. You don't think that sort of that sort of thing happens. But secondly, we tell you that. For example, under our side, we cater to the problem of doctors not being of doctors going into underdeveloped, underdeveloped, underdeveloped cities because our side has the has the regulation of us putting them into those into those uh, cities because we tell you that the mig that the, that cities now have control over these migrations and whatnot. Right? We tell you. And lastly, they try to tell you that these people, that internal migrants, are desperate for a job. So when, so now they will just um, quit their job because they have no racial diversity in their workforce. But we don't think so. We think if under that characterization that people under the characterization that people are desperate, people will do whatever it takes for you to get a stable income and whatnot, right? But let's look at the first question that we need to answer. Do cities have the right to have full autonomy over internal migrants? Do cities have the right to reject and accept these kind of migrants? They try to argue to you no, because they tell that everyone should have the right to movement. It's a fundamental right to begin with. But we don't think so. We think it's a trade-off we're willing to make. Because once you once you accept one family into a city and you disallow you just allow one family into the city, you save hundred other families from having a lesser developed city. And I'll later explain that in the second question that needs to be answered. We tell you states all and cities always have the best, always want the best for its people and have full responsibility over them. Our side caters to states being a failure and wanting to correct its mistakes. We also cater to the problem in which you allow people to do things. We think it's in the best interest of the city and state for us to reject and allow people and to have control over the regulation. Comparatively under their side, when you don't have regulations, you allow influx of people to come in. You allow, for example, 10,000 people from Kelantan to go into KL and living in slums. We tell you it's the worst condition to live on, right? Before I move on to the second um, comparison show. Um, and we understand that state made a mistake and now they should fix it. So they should bear the burden of fixing it. Why should the people suffer? Why should the people have their freedom of choice and movement violated for a mistake the state has made? Why cannot the state increase spending? Why should the people suffer for it? I'll, I'll, most of the, most of his questions will be answered in my in my second question. But even then, we tell you it's a trade off you're willing to make, right? Let's look at this trade off that we're willing to make. Let's look under their side. Right? When you don't have autonomy over these people, we tell you it's a short term benefit over a long term harm. The benefit is that you allow people to have the freedom of movement. You allow people to have the right to go into city and to live there. But with that comes in expense of you not having a proper life, not having the proper life, not having a proper job to begin with, and not, not having a proper income or pro possibly live, to a certain extent living in sums. Their side is this, you give people, uh, you give people the access to enter cities, whatever, and like, to a certain amount that they like. You allow people to explore the opportunities of the cities, but you also have to understand that their rights stop underdeveloped cities and developing cities to also want to develop. How? Because you don't allow people to, you don't force, you don't have the initiative for the governments to want to fix underdeveloped cities. Our side caters to that. How does our side work? Right? We've already told that we have regulations. You allow people, you even though we disallow people to have the right to total freedom and movement, we tell you it's a short-term harm that we're willing to make because it has a long-term benefit that is more probable. Because under our side, you save people from having, you save people People from having you save people to have a future to begin with because once you allow for an example an influx of people into a city you disallow a lot of other people in that city itself job opportunities you disallow them to want to develop as a state and as a city itself and that's detrimental because people don't get people don't want people won't get the benefits that we're supposed to get because you have a you have an influx of a thousand people going into your city right comparatively under outside you also allow the incentivize and you force state 
to cater to people who are not into the city because these people are pushed away from the city that is already developed. You are forced in incentivized states to go to underdeveloped cities and develop them, right? Because that side doesn't cater to that. Because that side has the influence of people going into the city. You leave rural areas like the the, the town that he lives with. You would just allow people to want to develop that sort of town, right? And tell you that's detrimental because yes, we agree, states give money to capital cities and we want to make every city as much as we can a capital city in order for them to get money. And that's a benefit that's only mutually exclusive under our side. But comparatively, right, that best case scenario is you allow people the freedom and the right to move, but at the same time, at the expense of other people having the right to develop and move itself. Comparatively under our side, when we do allow, when we have the harm of people being denied the right to movement, but you allow people to have as probable a probable stable and stability future you allow people to incentivize you allow states to you allow states to go and develop underdeveloped countries you also allow people to uh, to allow the exchange of uh, diversion and multicultural diversity as what they wanted our side caters to the problem because at the end of the day we have to come to an understanding that the only way for us to go and develop underdeveloped states and for us to maintain the quality of people living is to go with cycle So we see that both the government and the opposition over here have similar goals. They want development, they want to improve the life of every individual out there. We'll show you why our model is the best one to do so and why their one fails because they have structural issues over there. So first of all, let us see some clarification. Let us see where these uh, debate will actually clash off. The first of all, what we're going to show you is the reasons for migration. See, their whole characterization was based on the fact that people re migrate only for economic reasons. We're going to show you that is one part, but there are other reasons over there as well to which they do not have the right to violate them. Right. Then we're going to talk about how because how the decentralized development takes place better, uh, better under our model and how it fails over there, right? So first of all, let us see what they talked about over here. They talked about how poor people are there in India, and when they come to Mumbai, they just cannot live a life that's good enough. They talked about how these people technically will go there and have an illusion of a good life and end up having a worse life. But we showed to you from our side that, yes, there are poor people over there who are in such a desperate state. There are poor people over there who are in such a desperate state that they cannot get any kind of job over there. They cannot feed that poor mother who's lying in the bed. They cannot feed the two children who cry every night out of hunger. See, we see the situation is so desperate that they need to go out there and lead a life which they did not See, these people do not want to leave their families, but when they go out there, we see that they're desperate enough to go. And we say that even if this person is getting a quality of job that is not good enough, he's still send, he's getting a job, he's still sending back money, and that child is still getting to eat something at the end of the day. So therefore, we tell you that why for the economic reason, these people should be allowed to go. But then we talked about this, not just the economic reason. See, when Shafat and Jubar came and told that there are racial issues, there are social issues, we tell you what happens in India. See, in Indian poor villages, there are caste systems. That's what we actually mean over here from the racial and social issues. See, what happens is this person might be poor, but the reason why he will not be allowed to get inside the city is only because he's poor and there are quite a few people there. But what we see over here in these villages, this person is being persecuted. This person is being subjected to harms which he cannot deal with. He's being discriminated. So just on the basis of him being poor, you're not allowing him to enter. Just because on the basis that there are people over here, you're not allowing a person to enter who desperately needs to enter your city. See, we tell you that the right to movement is essential for every person over here. See, when we came up and talked about the tax incentive, when we came up and talked about how these people are equally contributing to the development of that capital, 
when we told you that the capital is increasing and how they are not being allowed to enjoy the benefits for which they paid, they did not come up with any kind of response over here. So therefore, we tell you that the reason that why would you in the first place, why would you pay for something? Why would you develop something? And why would you why would you be cheated out of actually using it in the first place? Why would you not be allowed to go and ride on that train in Dhaka city for which you pay the taxes? Why do you have to go and stay in that rural city where the roads are not good? Right. Second of all, we come over here in the second clash that they talk about. No, thank you, man. They talk about the brain drain that happens. They talk about the incentive structure. We're telling you that their whole incentive structure for the people in the cities accepting or rejecting people is completely wrong. See, what they're saying is that if there is a good teacher, for example, in city B, which is underdeveloped, and that person goes to city A, they will not take that person. We tell you that's not what's going to happen. We're going to see that the brain drain happens worse in their condition. See, we're going to see the city A, which is a developed city, actually wants to be developed even more. The mayor will want to be the mayor of the best city in Bangladesh. So therefore, what he will do is he will only accept the engineer and he will leave out the person or the manual labor that wants to come in. So therefore, all the engineers from city B who actually had a potential of developing that place will come into the city and get accepted because that's the idea. The city will now have the authority to accept them. So these people are going to get accepted. Who's going to be left behind? The fisherman, the boatman, the person who does not have the expertise to do anything in the first place. Right. Then we clashed off about the reason of multiculturalism. See, when we talked about the multiculturalism, we did not actually Actually mean about Malays and Tamils and all that. What we talked about was the multicultural education or the idea of technology that takes place over here. See, when Jubai came up and told us that, see, these people do not have the expertise needed to go back, and these people do not have the interaction, what happens under your model? See, the engineers and doctors and the teachers and the government officials stay in one place. They do not see that there is a person desperate enough to leave his family behind and come to the city in the first place. They're not seeing that this person is leaving his house behind and coming to KFC and working a low pay job. See, we're seeing over here that these people are never being able to empathize with these people. They're never being able to understand their plight. No, thank you, ma'am. No, thank you. These people are not being able to understand their plight. So when these people are not understanding their plight, how do you expect the kind of uh, concentric development you wish to happen to occur? See, this engineer is going to see that the person is working in my house or acting as my driver or serving me food in the McDonald's is actually someone who left his house, came over here, and is working a job that pays him $5 an hour. See, he's going to understand the situation is so bad that someone needs to take an initiative. So therefore, what's going to happen is in that uh, engineer or in that doctor's mind, he will actually have a greater incentive to go out, to reach out and make development occur in places which require development. See, under your model, these people will never know that some place needs development. Under our model, we're going to see that there's a greater incentive for people to go there and cause development. That is what we want, right? We want to increase or improve the standard of living of each and every person in that country. Yes, ma'am? So we don't think that the empathy only exists under your side. The empathy can also exist under our side because the state is finally taking an initiative because the situation is so bad in the first place. That empathy can exist under our side. Therefore, we think that the incentive is much greater now. Right, OK. So even if we consider that these people, even if you consider that the incentive is greater, how long will this kind of investment take place in the first place, right? How long do you think it will take for that place to open up schools? How long do you think it will take for that place to educate the children of these people? What about that fisherman who wants to come to Dhaka and live a better life? See, he will have to wait to give birth to his children and his grandchildren, and maybe they'll get a better education in Chittagam. But what about the person who needs it right now? What do you do to cater to their needs? What do you do to make sure that that person has a better standard of living? We tell you that under our model, under the status quo, we're not only defending the people that need economic reasons, we're defending the people from all from all sides who need to go there for social reasons, who need to go there for reasons just to themselves. They want to live the New York dream. They want to see the Statue of Liberty and live next to it. They want to live a life where he can go into a pub and meet his friends. That's the type of ideal that a person might have to go. That's the type of ideal that we're defending over here. See, your idea of violating the right or your idea of violating the right to movement and saying something absolute or fundamental right it's completely wrong we're telling you that these people have the right these people have the inherent right these people have the economic right the social right and as the biggest right of being a citizen of that country they need to go there they need to go wherever they want and they need to live their lives that suit them the best that is the develop that is the call that is what the government should provide and under our model we give you the life that's best for everyone thank you very much
So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the fate of this debate will be decided by a few questions. First of all, do cities or governments, in spite of all the problems that they have told and they have some made up even, uh, in spite of all the problems, do these cities and authorities have the right to impose upon the right of freedom of movement and freedom of choice? And do they have the right to actually make those people go through all the burden and pain, even though they were the, the cities and governments, it was the failure of the cities and governments, right? So on that point, we tell you that they have untouched a lot of points here. First of all, they have untouched the point of how every person has the freedom of movement within their own country. And no government, no city can overstep that authority and tell them, guess what, because we have messed up, we have failed. Now you do not have the authority to come to the capital because of our mistakes, ladies and gentlemen. They have failed to answer this completely, ladies and gentlemen. Also, moreover, ladies and gentlemen, we tell you why all people deserve the equal right to actually come to Dhaka or come to Kuala Lumpur, for example, because we have shown to you how all people pay equal taxes in my first speaker speech, if you recall, that everyone pays equal taxes, but these taxes are not spended equally. The government expenditure, expenditure is more on the capital cities. The government spend it more on improving the infrastructure job opportunities in the capital. They have the money. They have the resources. People are paying taxes, whether it is people from villages or people from capitals. However, it's the government's failure to invest that money properly. So we tell you that instead of pushing the people to cities, which uh, to rural areas, which has no use at all, because simply having work, laborers or workers there will not cause any change if there are no radical changes of capital and land there. We tell you that governments need to invest more, need to spend more on those places, and only then will be people allow, uh, willing to stay there. That is the way you can actually increase fair distribution of pop population, not by forcing them, ladies and gentlemen. Moreover, ladies and gentlemen, we have shown to you that why these cities and authorities do not deserve any right to do so. But even more, ladies and gentlemen, the idea of multiculturalism, which they fail to understand completely. See, they talk about how people will interact and so on. But understand this, we are not talking about, as my third speaker, Ishmael has said, Tamils or other types of people. We are talking about the different classes of people. See, under their model, only skilled engineers and doctors can go from Chittagong to Dhaka or come to Kuala Lumpur, for example. But what about the person who wants to work in McDonald's, maybe? What about the person, the average or low skilled worker who wants to feed or help his family, ladies and gentlemen. Understand this, that our burden was to prove to you that this unfairness takes place and it is not uh, it, and it is not right. See, they've talked to you about how everyone should get equal rights and so on, but they, they do not get so under their model. Under their model, they only accept high class people like engineers and doctors into the society, right? Into the city and they push out the low skill people. So where is the fairness? Where is the equal standards of life there, ladies and gentlemen? See, the idea of empathizing from one class to another, the engineers and doctors can no longer now go to KFC and see that as my third speaker has said, one person to feed his family has come up all the way here and is now making me my burgers and french fries they can no longer empathize with people they know can no longer connect with these people ladies and gentlemen understand this that they have told you that if more people stay in rural areas development will be done there well it might be maybe in 20 30 years ladies and gentlemen maybe after two or three generations and we believe this is not the proper way ladies and gentlemen we believe what about the fisherman or the fam or, or, or what about the person who needs to feed his family now he has no opportunity whatsoever we have shown to you that even if he comes to the city and works in McDonald's works as a person who polishes shoes. He still has a source of income. His uh, condition is still improved, ladies and gentlemen. And that is far better than the standards he's living in today, ladies and gentlemen. We have to show to you that their model fails completely. Why is that so? First of all, we have shown to you how that no government preserves the right to impose on your authority or freedom of movement of your choice, ladies and gentlemen. We have shown to you how their model is very unfair. It gives, as it gives some people the advantage of being born in Dhaka or the capital and another person if he's not being born in that place he does not have that equal right we have shown to you how it creates more class distinction ladies and gentlemen and we have shown to you how their whole case is based on maybes and could be's and whereas we showed you that their case fails, fails completely and thus we win this debate thank you very much thank you Mr. Reply. now invite When at the end of Op's whip speech, when they consider that yes, development could, could happen, but at the expense of a long time, that is when we won this debate. If that, if the time span is actually a, is the only harm that we are willing to absorb, we are willing to take the trade off as compared to you 
funneling all your engineers in an underdeveloped city to a developed city because they think that job prospects will be better there and leaving the underdeveloped city to continuously be underdeveloped at the end of the day we think that that is a shame and we are very very proud to oppose under that side first of all when they talk kept harping to you on the benefit of only upholding the rights of individuals mr speaker this is the right of an individual at itself at the expense of people who are in underdeveloped cities living in poverty people who are unable to develop because all the valuable skill sets engineers teachers doctors and even hard labor, even labor workers that are able to build buildings these are the kind of people that they are they actually have the initiative to go to developed countries because they think that life will be better there we are willing to we are actually mitigating this harm we are allowing the underdeveloped city to develop at the end of the day we think that the right of an individual is not predicated on the harm that can come to a majority of people at the end of the day a majority of people who are underdeveloped and are living in poverty and also under their side we think that the state has a right to take control over the rights of an individual if it actually can benefit this individual at the end of the day and in the long run an example of this is when the state takes away a some amount of your right to privacy in order to provide you safety that is the actually a thing that the state does in order to benefit everyone inside everyone that lives in that city everyone that lives in the state therefore we are okay with that number five they came out really late with the idea of diversity and how people cannot mix we think that that actually there's a circulation of people going through and from these under developed countries it's not only about rejecting these people it's also about accepting these people if this person has a, a, if this person like for instance if you are a doctor and you don't get into developed city a you can go to developed city b we do that therefore there's an exchange of all the races that he wanted to talk about which they never wanted to actually deal with our benefits number four he want to talk about how the interaction causes villages to develop but if all if their problem is that these people don't have the skill sets in that village and they have to exchange skill sets with people in the city that benefit is only predicated that that person that goes to a de developed city will come back to the underdeveloped city at the end of the day if that is the case we think that we think that this would would never happen why because if that person is so good at the skill sets and they go to a developed city and they see that the living standards there are really really good and are better this means that this person will never want to return to the underdeveloped city where he is forced to live in poverty and all the horrible situations that he wanted the state in his speech at the end of the day we think that this means that this person will never have the incentive and the exchange of skill sets would never happen which is basically their only benefit and we have completely brought that down so secondly all the harms that he wanted to push to us on how it harms the rights of the individuals we told you how the right of the individual should not come at the expense of harming many people in the underdeveloped city at the end of the day they never wanted to engage to you with our harms of how the insults can actually cause increase of crime rates because when people are going to develop cities because they assume that you have the illusion of jobs where you have the illusion of a good life and they don't get it we think we already characterized you that these people become desperate and we think that that is when the crime rates increase in order for you to have a developed country as a whole you have to develop each and every one of your cities you cannot just develop a capital that will that will not work we under our side allow underdeveloped cities to develop further because of the characteristics of cities that develop from inwards to outwards we think that when you have an incentive for the government which is people going into underdeveloped cities then the government has a direct incentive to do so you cannot keep telling us that the state fails if you actually don't allow the state to do their job if you don't provide the cooperation to the state in order for the, for the state to provide a better life for you a better life for your family at the end of the day we are very very proud to propose thank you thank you so much um, both sides across the board showed that the